Okay, I think it's uh, time for us to get started. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the webinar today by Concord Academy. My name is Ofa Hamdi and my guest today is Eric Abbott. Uh, we're going to get started with a few introductions and some of the uh, elements around safety moments, but at any point in time, please feel free to post your questions uh, in the questions section in your, um, in your screen, uh, and then we will have time for Q&A at the end. So um, considering the subject of this, uh, of this webinar today, it's actually, uh, I think in the audience, we're, we're having people from various uh, sides of the construction industry, not just industrial, uh, but we're also having people from the AEC industry, and it's always great to connect uh, everybody. I actually wanted to quickly present myself uh, for those who don't know me. Um, I started in project management uh, in the field actually, and then I uh, was doing my master of science, the second one uh, in engineering in project management, uh, where I did the work on and the research on advanced work packaging at the University of Texas at Austin. At the time I was the researcher in the uh, joint venture between the Construction Industry Institute and the Construction Owners Association of Alberta which was the joint venture that actually developed the initial uh, framework for the advanced work packaging system. I've been an auditor on uh, capital projects, uh, small, large and mega projects with the independent project analysis. After that, I became an independent consultant and founded the Advanced Work Packaging Institute and Concord Project Technologies. Uh, Concord Academy is an affiliate of Concord Project Technologies and is the primary uh, education organization that's presenting this webinar today. A little bit about Concord. Uh, Concord is a company that specializes in supporting owners, EPCs, and contractor companies in on their path to predictability. Our values are predictability, knowledge, empowerment, and we do so by sharing uh, and developing as much knowledge and tools as we can for our clients to achieve 100% of their projects on time and on budget. Sounds like an ambitious goal, but that's what the vision is for. And we're on that path uh, as well. And we hope our industry at large get to that point. Uh, Concord Project Technologies actually provided, uh, provides enterprise predictability packages. And these are meant for companies that would like to, at a portfolio level, at a company level, achieve more predictable outcomes in terms of safety, cost, schedule, and uh, business objectives as well. We do the same at the project level uh, with our flagship project predictability package. Uh, Concord Academy is the uh, premier global organization for capital projects training and certification on advanced work packaging. And of course, we actually work with uh, on special cases in on research and development work, especially in the implementation of the predictability tools and then advanced work packaging in new environments as well. Um, Many of you might know this, but for those who don't know, Concord actually invests in educating the industry and expanding overall our understanding of capital project leadership and capital project management through our uh, weekly publication and quarterly publication, Velocity, uh, which is openly um, available to the industry as well. So feel free to check that out. Actually, in the handouts on the right side of the screen, uh, you'll have a copy of the presentation of today, but also few of velocity issues as well. My guest today is uh, Eric Abbott, who works with Rosen and Electric. Eric is actually um, a client, um, part of Rosenden, maybe my favorite client, but also uh, a friend as well. Uh, Eric began his involvement in the union electrical industry as an apprentice in 1988. He's a veteran of our industry. His experience, actually, he has seen it all. So from an apprentice electrician to journeyman to general foreman to general superintendent uh, to director of field operations, director of operations training and development. And now in his current role of superintendent, uh, superintendent he focuses on performance planning and scheduling. And in his role within Rosen, then he has been supporting uh, you know, corporate initiatives around project planning and improvement planning as well. Uh, he actually reached out as part of his, uh, he's one of the very few people in the AEC industry who have paid attention to AWP early on. Actually, our relationship goes back to 2017 or 2018. Uh, and, um, you know, and, the, the, and, and uh, he has been actually uh, at the center of 
figuring out how to implement AWP in the context of, uh, uh, I would say, a non-industrial construction. But, you know, I think uh, we need to stop maybe separating our industry and looking at it, looking at capital projects in terms of complexity. Um, Eric, welcome and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Alfa. Excellent. So uh, this webinar is about sharing aspects of the journey of Rosenden implementing AWP in a data center project. Uh, the goal is that uh, this presentation is about to, you know, sharing those aspects around the implementation that obviously we could share in a in a public manner. Uh, but before we get started, I actually wanted to share with you uh, a safety moment that uh, for Concord actually we pay a lot of attention to. So in our study, uh, part of Concord Research and Development, we looked at productivity in the office for uh, knowledge workers in the capital projects industry. And these are engineers, managers, schedulers, anybody that's doing work behind the screen. And we uh, realized based on research that there is this notion of you know, all of the distractions that we go through uh, tend to hinder our ability to do deep work. Deep work is the amount of, is that kind of work that requires a lot of concentration and uninterrupted concentration to be able to produce work. So it's basically about knowledge production, whether we're reviewing a drawing, we're reviewing a report, we're delivering, we're building a presentation, uh, you know, we're, we're building a schedule, whatever that is, that's considered deep work. The issue with that, especially now with COVID and with remote working as well, is that we tend to, with so many distractions actually, it's very hard and it's getting harder for us to produce quality, deep work deliverables, which tends to also affect our um, satisfaction toward our work, but also affect our mental health as well. And so here are some, just um, from a safety perspective, some um, uh, recommendations that might be beneficial to you. First of all, please be mindful of the kind of notifications that you see in your screen and on your phone as well. So sometimes when that email notification pops up uh, and you decide not to answer that email, it actually takes space in your head and it prevents you from having that productive work that you need to do. So be mindful and conscious about the notifications. You might also consider blocking deep work time in your calendar. And so that's basically putting in your calendar time during which you're uninterrupted, you're doing work, you're not checking email, you're not taking calls, and you're focused on getting that deliverable done. And of course, by the end of the day, every day is different. So sometimes we go through those unproductive days. Uh, please leave the, you know, the lack of productivity of the previous day with that day. Don't bring it to today. That's it for the safety moment. Um, I actually, uh, today's webinar is gonna be structured around uh, four parts. Uh, first is an introduction to AWP. It's a really, really high level introduction just because we have people in the audience that might just be discovering AWP for the first time. Then Eric will go through the overview of Rosenden's AWP experience so far. He will share some lessons learned and then we will open the floor for Q&A. Okay, so let's talk about a quick high-level introduction to AWP. So uh, the essence of AWP and the why, why did AWP exist and why it was developed, goes back to looking at productivity in construction. This is a famous chart. Some of you might already know about it, but data comes from the U.S. Labor, of the, uh, of st uh, labor Statistics, uh, U.S. Office of Labor Statistics, and it basically compares labor in construction compared to other industries. This is basically to say, as you can see here, that labor productivity in the industry and the construction industry did not evolve in the way other industries did in manufacturing, transportation, utilities and other industries. And so at the macro level, you know, the idea is that how can we actually have that this major, you know, uh, change in, in productivity? So AWP actually looks at productivity from a labor productivity from a very, very detailed standpoint of view. So we want to look at labor in the field and we want to look at how much, how do they spend their time in the field and compare the time they spent on tools versus the time they spent on any other activity. And, you know, data from the industry shows that in the petrochemical sector, for example, we have an average of 37% on tool time. So out of a shift, a typical worker would spend 37% of their time on tools versus wait time, equipment, moving equipment, uh, moving from one place to the other, doing planning or quitting early. 
And so the idea is to, the question then is how can we increase the time spent on tools, which considering that labor cost is a major line item in the budget for a capital project or any construction project, that increase in productivity will result in obviously cost effectiveness, but will also result in a safer job. We all know, and based on especially those who have had experience in the field, uh, lack of productivity uh, in the field impacts motivation, impacts safety, and impacts quality as well. So AWP actually started early on. Uh, it was considered as a best practice around 2006 in Canada, in Western Canada, on some of the oil and gas projects. And at the time, it was called workface planning. So it was based on this idea that we will take the packages in the field, we'll break them down into smaller packages, we'll prepare them or pre prepare them in a way uh, for the labor and so that we can enable them to do to spend more time doing the work and less time waiting and so this resulted in an increase in in uh, labor on tool time from 37 percent to 47 percent so at the time this was considered the best practice in the work in the petrochemical industry that's what triggered basically the entire research on how can we take this and how can we expand, ex, expand this to the entire life cycle of a capital project, from early definition to engineering, BIM design, to actual execution? The second metric that AWP focuses at is supervision time. And the first line of supervision, if we look at their average time spent in a typical shift on how much they spend actually directly supervising the crew, it's only 15% in our industry. And so what we want to do is we want them to, we want to clear their time, this 20% on planning that you see here in blue, we want to clear that time to them so that they can spend their time mostly focused on what increases productivity, quality, quality instructions, and um, safety as well in the field, and that's supervision. So in, in a nutshell, you know, I spent actually um, years when I was doing my thesis on AWP documenting what are the various incidents and how does unpredictable construction happen and what can what is actually the leading cost to that and what i found out and this is also the result that was found out by many other organizations so it's not just my thesis but if we look at virtually many industry organizations depending on their actually orientation but they all agree that a lot of what happens in the field has its root cause also in the office and so issues like scope changes poor management, uh, poor risk management, late engineering, which is actually virtually one of the uh, highest uh, or biggest problems in our industry today, poor sequences and poor planning actually, as well as high turnover, poor definition and inadequate staffing, all contribute to unpredictable construction. And so what AWP does is that it actually uh, looks at the entire life cycle and starts to create what we call construction-driven planning, then construction-driven engineering, then construction workplace planning. And so overall, just in a nutshell, the structure is divided as follows. So as you can see in the screen here, we start with the end in mind. We look at the construction phase, which is represented in this red cir circle. The process of creating what we call installation work packages or IWPs, and these are the smallest work packages delivered to the crew in the field in a manner that is prepared and clearing the issues around them, clearing constraints, preparing a backlog of IWPs that could be used in case of change. All of that process is called workplace planning. To get to that point, because this process is like technology, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you have a poor plan and you apply workplace planning, you're still gonna see the issues. So what we wanna do is create a good plan so that, and good drawing deliverables, that way, when we get to the field and we're applying workplace planning, it's seamless. And so AWP looks at the early stages of the project, and that's the advanced part in advanced work packaging, so advanced in time. And we start with project setup, where we develop the very first formal deliverable of AWP, which is the path of construction that you see here upon you know, the interactive planning exercise. The PUC of the path of construction is something that Eric will talk to you about in the context of how Rosenden has, a, has adopted this component of AWP. The path of construction lays down also the structure in terms of work packaging. Every company somehow tends to look at this differently, but the best practice in the petrochemical industry is that we create what we call 
engineering work packages or EWPs and construction work packages or CWPs. I would like to invite you to check out our other resources, free webinars, but also other you know, um, available resources for you as well. And I'll share with those at the end of the presentation where you can have more details about what a CWP is, what an EWP is, what is a path of construction, what, you know, all of those fundamentals. We all, we, you know, Concord actually has been committed to sharing those and educating the industry about those. But now we'll talk about our case study, which is um, Rosenden's case study on AWP and what's new, what, what parts of AWP did they apply, and then we'll open the question to Q&A. Eric, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Alpha. And on behalf of um, Rosaden and myself, I'd like to thank Alpha and Concord Project Technologies. Um, we're, we're certainly honored uh, to participate in this webinar. Uh, we also want to acknowledge Alpha and Concord for uh, supporting us, <clears throat> supporting our company in terms of guidance, flexibility, uh, patience as we try to um you know implement awp in our company and within our industry and also would like to for sure thank everyone who's taken the time to attend um certainly grateful excited to be here uh, and hopefully we can provide some uh some meaningful insight for everybody um jump into let's begin with while we're why we're pursuing this initiative um in our core values, one of our core values is we innovate, and it's a little bit hard to read with the colors going through there. Um, people will remember us for the solutions we provide. Entrepreneurial ideas are encouraged and promoted continuously, raising industry standards. So at the heart of everything, that's our goal. We, we want to innovate. We don't want to innovate just within Rosenden. We also want to innovate within the industry as well. Uh, next, please. Okay, so we're going to continue with why uh, Rosenin's considering AWP, uh, and an AWP is Advanced Work Packaging. Uh, that's what the acronym stands for. For us. We've tried to brand it a little bit for ourselves in our industry, and we're calling it advanced work planning. The primary tenets of, of uh, the industrial program, we are, we are on board with um, building a path, construction-driven path of construction and work-based planning. Um, the heart of, of why is kind of illustrated on the right. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the illustration, you'll see the project timeline from start to finish, left to right, and you will see in blue a cost influence curve. And then you'll see in red actual cost curve. This is called a cost influence curve. Um, so you can see early in the project when our actual costs are low, our ability to effect change in terms of cost and schedule is very high. So you can see by the illustration, looking at the, the intersection of kind of where construction starts, working to the left, the earlier we can start our planning process, it brings us more ability to influence cost and schedule. As we get closer to construction and start construction, it's very clear that we have a radical kind of shift in our ability to influence costs. That goes down dramatically as our actual costs in increase. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, we have some bullets of goals we're, certain, we're, we're trying to attain. One of our big goals is predictability. Um, and we're talking about early predictability. Uh, we're really good at predicting things that like 90% complete, uh, not so good at predicting things at you know a zero to 10% complete. Um, so we're kind of shifting. We're not just focused on on profitability. That's obviously that's important, but we want to have we want to uh, have this um, foundation of predictable thinking. Um, the consistency piece 
Uh, we're a large company. Uh, we have a national footprint and it's important for us to have a formalized and disciplined planning program that can be duplicated in these different regions that we're in. In terms of scalability, um, not only are we in different regions, obviously we have uh, many different types and sizes of projects. So we want a program that can address the different types and sizes in terms of their customization. In other words, we can't just develop an automated process for our planning. Um, there's, there's a custom aspect to it, and then there's a scalable aspect to it. Uh, the culture piece, um, you know, we want to establish a more deep-rooted planning culture. Our industry tends to be somewhat reactive. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying our best to uh, put a lot of effort and uh, concentration on that front-end planning and trying to stick with that plan. Uh, collaboration, establish a more disciplined approach to internal and external collaboration. Um, you know, what this means is, is um, not having everything via email or not having everything by verbal conversation, but having a program that our foundation of our communication is, is consistent. Uh, next, please. Okay. So here we'll start to touch on the how. Um, and, you know, like Ulf had mentioned earlier, you know, step one for us is POC development, uh, which is the path of construction. Um, the path of construction is the foundation of everything. So we can work on the data setup, the IWP preparation and execution. However, if the, if the path of construction, if the plan isn't solid, we're going to be building everything on a shaky foundation. I think Alpha touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, the second piece of it is the workplace planning piece. And for us, there's three major components of the workplace planning. Uh, step two is the data setup. And here is where we will establish uh, our advanced work planning folder structure. Our folder structure is set up electronically and the organization of that folder structure aligns exactly with the path of construction organization. Here's where we're also look at uh, schedule, work package, and BIM information type of cross-references uh, where we get these different languages talking to each other. Um, and uh, I'll touch a little bit more, a little more detail on that later. Um, and for us, our, we have two primary outputs that come out of this data setup. One is our AWP log. Um, for us, for those that are familiar with the formal petrochemical uh, program, our AWP log consists mainly of two things. Um, one, the first is the release plan, and the second is the constraint tracking. Uh, and our second, um, output for us, our second critical output is our BIM installation drawing log. Uh, jumping to step three, IWP pre preparation. Uh, this is where we're gathering all of our base information. So we've done all our work, path of construction. We've, we've done our data setup. Now we're starting to build the instructions and putting the instructions into each one of those folders. Um, this is uh, things like prefab and purchasing information, uh, installation drawings, uh, work package activity planners. So in the simple terms, what we're trying to do here for both our prefab operation and our field installations is we are trying to provide the illustration and the instructions for those people to work off of. Um, Step four is the work package execution. Uh, for us, and Alpha touched on a little bit earlier, we have two primary components to this. And, and this is where we start to focus a lot on constraint tracking. Um, the first aspect of our constraint tracking is more information, uh, materials, procurement, 
um, uh, prefab, uh, making sure everything is ready and staged at a work package level. When we have things staged at a work package level, that's where we have what Ulfa described earlier as a backlog. And we have a formal way that we track the backlog. So in the event that, that so sequencing changes or there's a shift on the construction site, we can go to our backlog and pull the, the appropriate package out of there and kind of following that just in time, you know, lean type of mentality. Um, one thing we've learned is our backlog, we tried to have that four weeks in advance. Um, that was a little lofty goal. I know that's a great goal. We're, we're focused more on having a backlog two weeks advance of installation. Uh, next, please. Okay, so let's explain in more detail what a POC framework organization is and the steps of how it's put together. And like Ulfa had said earlier, um, we always want to start with the end in mind. So this slide is a slide that I will show um, with, the, with our field operations when we're going into building a path of construction. And we'll always start at the, at the end in terms of our end goal is to have an installation work package. Um, and that package we want to be executable, measurable, uh, and we want to be able to have that constraint free. Um, so big picture on the right, um, we have an area phase breakdown. This is when we were talking earlier about the customization, the area phase breakdown is the custom part. All of our jobs are different and here's where we start to organize those areas and phases. And then the second big chunk is the scope breakdown. Here's where we try to build more scalability into it and have kind of a more consistent approach to how we uh, break down our scope for each area or phase. Um, so starting at the top high level um, areas, buildings in a data center, um, you know, you probably have things more like uh, substations, uh, we almost always have site work, work that's outside the structures, uh, actual data center buildings. Oftentimes there's MEP support buildings, generator yards, things of the, that nature um, that can be separate, separate buildings that live by themselves. And we almost always have at this level uh, an administrative support building. Uh, phases, some of the phases we'll typically see is uh, substructure, structure, exterior skin, interior build out, substructure, everything underneath the footprint of the building, structure, you know, the structure phase is, is structural steel, uh, port in place concrete, that type of stuff for us. It's, it's you know, usually things like um, uh, critical things like supports that we put into these concrete pores, uh, inserts. Uh, any sleeves, any block outs, uh, and sometimes we actually have conduit that we run uh, through there. So the phases are important for us because the areas that we get to later, kind of some of the sub areas are different. They're not always the same for us based on the phase. So a, an area for the substructure, um, the way that's built in the path of construction may be different from an area within the interior build out phase. So jumping into sub areas, um, floors, vertical areas, those are very common. Data centers typically aren't super tall buildings. Um, so their areas, their sub areas tend to be things more like, uh, they do, we do have floors and risers, you know, oftentimes there's a penthouse area. Um, but a lot of times they're so big, they're, they're broken into things like area A, B, C, D, area one, two, three, four, uh, that type of thing. And then uh, within the sub areas, the next level of sub areas um, in data center construction, oftentimes there's more um, mechanical types of rooms. Um, you know, there's electrical rooms, oftentimes generator rooms, if those are built into the building, uh, UPS rooms, uh, mechanical support rooms, um, 
water treatment rooms perhaps. Uh, for sure, in the data center world, there's definitely, and now in, in all construction, but it's very prevalent in data centers, is the MPOE, MDF, IDF rooms. Uh, we break those out all the time. Those are kind of critical path items that often need to be delivered earlier. Um, and then there's data halls typically as well. So that's kind of the area phase breakout organization that we'll look at. Then we'll jump to the scope breakdown. And for us, we jump to what we call uh, CFAs or construction flow activities. Um, and this is where we try to introduce the scalability. So it doesn't matter what type of job I go to when I'm helping build a path of construction. Anytime we get to the end of an area, whether it's a building or whether it's a room, we will go through our list of CFAs and say, does this CFA apply? And for us, we have 18 standard CFAs and they follow the flow of construction from beginning to end. Um, starting with things like temporary power, uh, underground, and then as you get kind of more into the inside build out, you know, we have things like overhead rough, wall rough, um, underfloor rough. Underfloor rough is, is prevalent in many data centers that have a raised floor type of construction. Uh, and then we have CFAs that are kind of more on the back end, things like equipment connections and trim. And then our final step is the actual installation work package. Um, this is where we have some IWP guidelines. Our IWP guidelines are slightly different than the formal petrochemical world. Um, we follow the same, uh, you know, attributes, the same philosophy, but they're a little bit different. We have things like 15 working day upper limit. That's kind of our top end. We want to be able to visualize progress. Uh, you know, we're completely focused on uh, physical percent completes. Um, and we, one of the most important parts is when we're building our path in construction and we get to an IWP level, we are always reiterating that we want to plan for things that can be completed 100% once they start. So we're always keeping that thought uh, in mind at a planning level. Next, please. All right. Oops, can you go? Uh, thank you. Okay, so use of the path of construction. Uh, here's where we're going to touch on a little bit more human uh, aspects of the path of construction. So this photo on the right is an actual workshop, a POC development workshop at a data center project that we were on. Um, so on the left, the first couple bullets, we consider the POC as the foundation for better planning, true. The goal is to incorporate the general foreman's construction experience and expertise into a predictable solid plan. Critical, important, true. Developing the POC is a collaborative effort. Very true. So those things are all great. They're all true and they're all nice things. Um, what we're really trying to illustrate here is we can't say to people, hey, guess what, the PLC is important and it's the foundation uh, and make sure you have the general foreman and the field uh, supervisors involved with building the PLC and make sure you guys collaborate. You know, we need to go out there and we need to show that we support this effort and we need to instruct people on how to do the, this. It, it's, it's not part of our culture yet um, so what you're seeing here, what's important to me is you see a, a, a wide a, a wide group of people and in front you see a VP of operations, that's David Elkins, who is showing the support. He's, he, he's there to, to, to emphasize how important this is for our company and our industry. And then myself, I'm there more as a as a coach, as a mentor in terms of, hey, here's how you do it. Um, the next bullet, it helps us distinguish planning from scheduling. 
<clears throat> so to me, this is a critical bullet. Um, so we developed a path of construction. Our goal is to develop that path of construction organization with, with the right people, with the operations, uh, construction driven mentality and making that path of construction as accurate as possible to a work package level. Then we want to hand that over to our schedulers and they can incorporate that into our schedules. What we're trying to get away from is handing a general foreman, site superintendent, um, you know, a 200 page P6 PDF and saying to them, hey, I, hey, does this look good? And And our guys just get overwhelmed looking at that and they have a tendency to nod their head and say it looks good. And that kind of goes back to Ulfa's, one of her original points of it's sort of garbage in, garbage out. So our schedulers are critical people using whatever schedules are available for us, you know, from a GC or a CM are helpful tools for us to build our path at construction. Um, but we want to make sure that it's a construction driven plan organization that we're handing over to our schedulers as a foundation. Uh, AWP is about advanced planning for us. Um, we are in, we're in a different model than the petrochemical world. We are a subcontractor and we're trying to influence up. It's not a top down approach necessarily. So we're trying to influence up. Oftentimes our contracts are awarded late. So we can't continue to say to ourselves, um, we're victims. We can't start planning early because our contracts are, are awarded late. They're awarded close to that intersection point in the cost curve of when construction starts. We have to acknowledge that we need to invest in that planning before award at some times and also continue working with the industry in terms of smart contracts and things like that to kind of get those contracts awarded earlier. Uh, next, please. So this is probably uh, my favorite slide. Um, PLC quality depends on the level of input from field supervisors, foreman, general foreman, et cetera. Um, I, I, I would definitely include project management in there as well. So here is a great visual of uh, some collaboration happening, active collaboration. In orange, this is our site superintendent. This is the person that's directly responsible for field operations out in the field every day. Um, and you can see he's engaged. On the left, we have another site superintendent. So for us, the data center projects are often what we would consider mega projects, maybe not uh, big relative to some of the petrochemical world, uh, but for us, are, they're massive. And we oftentimes have two site superintendents, one's more field um, focused, boots on the ground, one's more customer interface focused. And I may not have the titles exactly right, but those two people in general, work in parallel with each other, uh, kind of at the same level from an org chart perspective. And it's critical for that person with the customer interface to understand and contribute to the path of construction. And finally, in between those two, we have our project executive. And this project executive, the fact that he has his arm up and is pointing and looking at something to me, was very encouraging because that person is engaged and understands. And then on the far right, you have myself, which is basically the AWP champion for the job. And my number one job right here in this environment is to listen. So I'm listening and seeking to understand what these people are talking about so we can adjust the path of construction to kind of match that. Next, please. All right, so we're gonna jump into the second main component of advanced work planning, um, and that is the work phase planning. So 
this, uh, in my mind, this is a great illustration. Um, the Workface Planner is a unique skill set. Um, and this illustrates how many different touch points a Workface Planner may have. And this may, this Workface Planner in the center, it may be more than one person. So they touch project controls, project management, scheduling, they touch those things, construction, general foreman, site superintendents, logistics agent, you know, which is a fancy term for material handling, um, procurement, purchasing, for sure, heavily involved with prefab and packaging. And if we are doing any uh, true modular construction, uh, and then definitely heavily involved um, with the BIM and detailing component. Um, so their job, as you can see, is, is to interface with all these different groups. And in my mind, this is more of a newer role for us. And I think it's one of the most critical company uh, roles, project level roles uh, that we have. Next, please. Okay, so here we'll touch on some uh, workplace planning recommendations and, and kind of reiterate some of the reasons why. So uh, recommended practice data setup can be done remotely from the back office. So we looked at that initially, the data setup and what that consists of um, building out the path of constructions built. We, we put the effort into building the path of construction, data, data setup people, uh, creating the folder structure that matches that, creating the content that goes into the cross references, creating the um, advanced work planning log and supporting the BIM installation drawing log. Those are functions that are part of the data setup. And in terms of being done, you know, back office, in other words, we're, we're trying to say those can be done off site. It doesn't need to be done off site, but in the COVID world for sure, um, and in our industry where we are resource challenged um, and we're focusing more, people are actually starting to focus more on work-life balance, quality of life types of thoughts, um, being able to support some of this with the right people um, remotely is, is helpful. Uh, the IWP preparation and execution, um, that needs to be done by the workface planner while on site. So that person, if I'm writing a scope letter for that person, I'm gonna say things like, you will be um, minimum 50% in the field every day. So this person is very hands-on. This person is has direct interaction with the field supervisors, is constantly looking at the quality of the packages, the quality of the information, um, has to understand site conditions in terms of are the areas ready in terms of constraint tracking and also looking at uh, physical percentage completes. Uh, this is considered an investment rather than a cost. So we're trying to clear the way for more time for more field supervision to focus on safety, labor productivity and quality installation. Ulfa showed that really well earlier with some of the pie charts where we're focused on time on tools. And at the end of the day, our goal is to get to an installation at an IWP or a work package level that is constraint free. We need to keep asking ourselves, is, is having a work package installation constraint free reasonable that's a question i find myself asking people constantly and it's a culture shift for us we are not necessarily used to in our industry uh, having constraint free uh, activities or work packages so going back up to building the path of construction this is why we're always reiterating that while we're building that plan we always we want to start with that thought process because here's where the rubber hits the road uh, with the workface planner. Uh, next, please. Uh, next. So we just want to share some, you know, kind of be transparent about some things we've learned. Uh, some of these things are are super cool. Some of them are not so cool. Um, so th this piece 
Uh, we talked about integration with BIM and detailing and cross-references a couple times, and, and we're going to touch on these in further detail here. So the first bullet, project level of contractual or internally chosen BIM use for installation drawings. <clears throat> what does that mean? So we'll always have contractual requirements for BIM, you know, whatever those are. And whatever we're contractually required to do through modeling, those will be those uh, that effort will be applied to our installation drawings also. Um, in the event we choose internally to go past further than what the contract requires, in other words, to do a higher level of modeling than what the contract requires just for ourselves because we see the benefit in it. In that event, we're going to use our modeling process to drive installation drawings also. In the event that we're not using BIM for some of the installation drawings, you know, we're using other technology like a blue beam uh, drawing process or something like that, um, you know, we need to identify that. And the key is, is that on our BIM installation drawing log, we have our IWPs in our, our shop drawings listed and we are identifying early who is going to do those, whether it's coming through the BIM department or whether it's someone else that's doing those drawings. Um, these next four bullets are super important relative to the cross references we were touching on. So here's where technology and things can start to get kind of complex and, and we need to kind of understand it and, and address it. So we have different types of languages. Um, we have a CM schedule terminology language, whatever that is. If it's a P6, they may have a unique P6 ID number that they use for their um, activities. Uh, we have our own work package terminology. So we have unique IDs for each one of our work packages. In a perfect world, our work package terminology and the CM schedule terminology would be exactly the same. In the event they're not, we need to develop a way for those two things to talk to each other. Um, there also is oftentimes a construction management or, or general contractor um, virtual design schedule. And within that schedule, they have their own terminology also. The terminology typically will relate to modeling, modeling sign off and shop drawing. And then jumping to the next bullet, we have we have a very robust BIM department and they're very process driven and they need to be process driven. Um, they have a very clear list of shop drawings and terminology that they follow. That terminology is different than the terminology in the CM uh, VDC schedule. Those two things need to talk to each other. And then finally, we have um, our work package terminology and our shop drawing terminology. Those things need to talk to each other also. So what we've done is we've created macros that, that look at all of those things and tie those things together so that every time we have, uh, oftentimes we get uh, monthly schedule updates, contractual schedule updates. So every time we get a monthly update, um, we can automatically update our uh, AWP log and our BIM installation drawing log. And then the, the last one, um, the one thing we've learned is our BIM team needs clear direction from the project teams. Um, and that sounds easy, but we just talked about some of the cross references that maybe make it more complex than we thought. So we also need support from the company to help develop the tools to make that communication uh, realistic. Next, please. Okay, so finally, um, you know, these are more people related observations. Uh, there is a maturity curve. OFIS talked a lot about the maturity curve in, in the petrochemical industry. We're kind of in the infancy. Uh, we're early for us. For me, personally, I have to understand that things are not happening as, things may not happen as quickly as I'd like. Um, so, uh, little victories, 
uh, you need to you need to take those and and be thankful for them. Um, things may be a little bit slower than you hoped, but you know appreciate the small victories and definitely don't give up. Um, the complexities we just talked about some of those. For me, the key is at the end of the day we want to give our field a package with the illustration and the instructions that they can install. The complexities are real. The projects we work on are large. Um, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. Our focus is on keeping those complexities kind of behind the scenes and making the installation more simple. Uh, project team buy-in and support. So by this, I mean complete project team buy-in and support. If, if there's only partial buy-in and support, you have a couple choices. Um, number one, um, you know, get different people that are going to support it. Uh, number two, um, if you see that there's a group, a part of the team that doesn't support it, your efforts are probably uh, better served somewhere else. And number three, if if you don't have that support, uh, you're going to end up pretty frustrated. So that entire project team buy-in support is critical. <clears throat> the shift in accountability, um, you were, we're very accustomed to uh, measuring productivity out in the field. We are less accustomed to measuring productivity of the things that impact the field installations. So we have shifted that that awareness or that accountability. It's not that the accountability isn't in the field also, but we've shifted at some accountability earlier. Um, that's new for some people and sometimes a little bit uncomfortable. The transparency piece, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll shine a light on some processes that aren't quite as efficient as they could be. Um, the trust piece is maybe the most important. Um, so, you know, this is trust in terms of allowing people to make mistakes and be okay with it. One of the biggest issues building the path of construction or filling out an activity planner for people is they hesitate. They hesitate because they don't want to make a mistake and they don't want to get blown up for it. So we need to have a safe zone and allow people to make mistakes. And then finally, the importance of leadership, support, and sponsorship. We're talking about upper management, uh, CEO level. Um, the CEO level people need to, uh, you know, executive level need to always uh, be talking about the program and always reinforcing their support. Uh, and that's that's all I have, Wolf. Eric, thank you so, so much for your presentation and for sharing, you know, your experience and the uh, the team's experience on this. Um, I have a few comments on some of what you touched, um, what you mentioned, actually, and then we'll uh, see some of the questions, actually, from the uh, from the audience. Uh, if I can just, yeah, I'm seeing the question here. So. I think you mentioned here a component that I would like to emphasize uh, on. I'm, so, I'm sure many people would ask the question, you know, how did Rosadin came to, to consider AWP? Uh, I would like to mention actually some of a little bit of the story. Um, you know, when uh, when we get when we got started, the, when the conversation got started between Concord and Rosenden, uh, just to highlight the importance of executive leadership, talking about predictability, predictable project delivery, and AWP was happening at the CEO level, so at the executive level. And um, I would like to say, you know, Concord, I, I co-founded it as a California company, so we, you, you guys were our first California-based client. And so it was it was really um, really something for us to discover uh, a company like yours, employee owned, uh, growing, growing and growing fast, actually with really a good um, reputation. Um, a company also that's kind of like daring. So in terms of diversity of portfolio, you're taking more and more complex projects, diverse portfolios. And so there is this kind of like hands-on you know, uh, perspective from the executive leadership early on years ago, uh, and it continues on the operational side of things, which is very unique, uh, especially now. I mean, if we look at, for example, in comparison to 
um, you know, companies, corporations in the in the petrochemical industry, construction industry, capital projects industry, we're seeing a variety of of uh, even the way we interact with executives within Concord. We see a variety of of profiles from an executive leadership. Some would focus more on the financial side of things, contractual side of things are are less uh, looking into the details of operations. More, others are more hands-on and they tend to bridge that gap between the business and engineering and construction, which has been the case for Rosenden. And I would like to emphasize the importance of that for making this happen. So um, thank you for mentioning that. That was really important. You also touched based on some of the principles around AWP and the fact that the name changed, became advanced work planning. And, and I'd like actually to highlight this. Uh, I know there is this debate in the industry around you know, workplace planning or AWP and, you know, how does it fit to other industries and so on. And working with you guys on this experience uh, has helped Concord even push forward what we call the principles of AWP. And so the idea is that there are really fundamental principles which are best practical on construction-driven planning, construction-driven engineering and BIM. So a lot of projects and companies, especially companies, that grew fast they and you know they ended up growing with the larger and larger BIM department which because engineering happens first then we started having more design driven projects rather than construction driven projects so making that shift right is is a principle by itself so you know my addition to what you eloquently presented uh today is to actually call it whatever you want as long as you go for the principles and try to 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 implement it now I have a question actually. Um, I have we have we have a lot of questions actually um, that uh, are asked. There is a question um, uh, about actually the GC, and I know Eric, you mentioned the relationship with the GC. So the question is, what what would you recommend um, either to the client, the owner basically, or the general contractor? um in supporting awp and construction driven planning um to align uh with engineering as well so what is your recommendation to either the client or the gc side um i mean our recommendation is is really to be uh, open and collaborate it's not it's not a whole lot more complicated than that um you know, we're going to focus on a lot of times there's a focus on, um, you know, pull planning and, and things of that nature. Um, and those things are fine. They, they are. Um, however, I think that collaboration in terms of building the framework of the path of construction, uh, building the chunks, building the steps, and then going into the pull planning process is is important. And I also feel one of, the, one of the things we didn't really touch on is uh, we have what we call a um, uh, path of construction action log. So as we're building a path of construction, questions come up. And this goes back to the quality of communication and, and discipline of communication. And we have to write down our questions very clearly and concisely so that when we meet with our customers, when we meet with our GCs, um, we 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 have it's not just a bunch of random thoughts we have a very disciplined approach to how we're we're looking at the path of construction and um you know i think for sure i i think the collaboration is the biggest piece i i hope i answered that okay yes thank you so i i know we're reaching the end of the hour maybe we'll take just a couple more minutes for another question and closing out uh, there is another question from Tai actually that he talks about currently uh, the relationship of AWP to estimating. So he says that we break our estimates down by bid items and systems, and understanding the path of construction to our enterprise input might be useful. So he's asking the question. Um, okay, do you? Okay, why why does the work phase planning slide? Oh, does the work phase planning slide show any interaction with estimating? Can you develop on the connection between work phase planning and estimating? Yeah, for sure. That's a that's really a it's a it's a great question and it's a it's a critical component. And when I look at it, when I talk about our maturity curve, 
this is a great example. Um, for us, building the path of construction early and having estimating support to break, you know, we'll, we'll already have an estimate that's done in a different manner. Maybe it's done by systems and sheets, um, but getting, getting that estimating, number one, getting the path of construction to the estimating department. Having an estimate, estimate set up in a manner, um, usually by sheets and systems and material codes, um, you know, something that where it's set up where, where it's easier to break things into those work packages or take that original estimate and structure it into the work package. Um, and I, I do think, again, the maturity curve, I think that um, the work packaging is new to people in terms of estimating. Yeah. So sometimes it's looked at as a major um, uh, effort and, and, and something we kind of avoid. But as we get more and more used to it, what we're finding is how we how we put together a priority wall rough in uh, uh, package, an estimate for that. We start getting used to doing that. So I think number one, uh, what I found is getting that path of construction in front of the estimating department as quickly as possible is important, and having those 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 you know. Um, uh, war room type of meetings with estimating where they're getting the field integration and, and the project management um, uh, integration also. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. I know there are uh, many other questions actually, but we will try to uh, get back with you all by email with some of these answers uh, to your questions. I would like to thank you, Eric, for uh, your time today. Uh, and thank you all for attending, for staying up to the end of the hour. Just a quick uh, references. Please know that Concord Academy provides free webinars on AWP fundamentals, implementation scenarios, and the famous question about Lean IPD or AWP. So there is a, a <laughs> webinar about it. So please, if you have that, I've, I've seen the question asked. There is an entire hour discussing this with great experts on Lean as well in the industry. Uh, there is also Velocity Issue 8. Uh, we actually created an entire fundamentals issue on AWP that's available in the handouts that you can download. The link is always also there. Uh, there is our Concord Fundamentals series, which is also available online, which covers all the basics of AWP. We call it AWP Basics for Everyone. Um, and we, you know, if you're looking for more detailed uh, certifiable uh, training. We have our AWP and workplace planning certifications, which are online, virtual, self-paced, and they come with a lot of support, um, templates, uh, access to knowledge, and you can do it on your own, and which is being used actually by major companies uh, across the globe. And we're really grateful for, for making advance in the industry this way. So feel free to reach out to us through this link if you're interested. And finally, for those who are looking to you know, just uh, uh, understand AWP at a very high level. Uh, there is the AWP 101, which is also available on our website as well. This is it for today. Thank you all. Please feel free to reach out and uh, I'll see you soon in another uh, webinar uh, of Concord Academy. Thank you, Eric. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it.